All right, so uh, looking at this, we're going to continue talking about the Industrial Revolution. Um, and this is uh, probably one of my favorite topics uh, because it's just so impactful. There's so much going on. Uh, in the first section, we talked about mass production and how that applied to the textile industry and some of the other industries uh, um, and factories and how that grew mass production and how goods are now going to be produced much more efficiently. And today, we're going to kind of talk about how agriculture was changed and some of the mechanization that's going to take place in the realm of agriculture. We're also going to talk about steel and electricity during this um, lecture as, as well, very, very briefly. And then in the last one, we're going to talk about some of the other changes and the social aspects that changed during the Industrial Revolution. Now, one of the uh, big dilemmas that takes place during the Industrial Revolution is what's the most profitable way to go about uh, implementing these technologies? Do you turn your attention to the factory and finished goods products? and use all your innovation there? Or do you turn your attention to the agricultural side in producing raw materials and, and, and food and all of that stuff? And we'll see that in both cases, um, you know, we, are, we get heavy, heavy innovation in both. But the one that I would say, if you had to say, you know, chicken and the egg kind of idea here, uh, agriculture is probably the one that has to come first because when you have a more efficient production of agriculture, just like at the earliest civilizations that we talked about in, in um, this class, the thing that really pushed civilization forward was the ability to grow more food. A food surplus creates more ability to innovate in other areas and sustain a larger population, which is in turn going to create more um, advancements in other areas. And so, um, we're going to definitely see some major advancements in the realm of agriculture, really in its common sense um, stuff that is surprisingly, it took way longer in civilization to create these, these uh, machines than it should have. Now, uh, some of the ideas of you know, the steam power and some of these things that we talked about in the first lecture, they're not going to come about until, and be put on these machines until you know, the 1800s, late 1800s. But the basic idea of how to improve agriculture is going to date all the way back to the, really the early 1700s, okay? And um, these two major innovations that at first did not require uh, steam, but then once you add steam power and engine power to them are really going to take off are the seed drill and the mechanical reaper. Now, this is a seed drill here. Now, if the way it works is you have this section up here, you would pull it with a horse initially. This is all the way back in the early 1700s. And uh, you would pull it along the rows that you had tilled up. Now, um, before this invention, you had to go out there, and I don't know if any of you have ever had a uh, garden or your parents had a small garden in the back. You grew some vegetables. You know, I know everybody's mom loves growing tomatoes and strawberries or whatever they want to grow. Uh, my, my parents have a huge garden, huge garden, uh, but you till up the rows and then you go and where the rows have kind of piled up, you go and, and if you don't have a mechanical or you don't have a seed drill, you go out with your finger and you go boop and you push the soil down and then you put the seed in there and then you cover it up. Well, that's what this thing did. Essentially, you have the two hoppers that hold seeds at the bottom of these is a, or at the front of this, as it turns, there's a piston that makes a hole. And then um, it punches down, and then the, it comes around and drops a seed. Uh, and then there's a thing here at the back that covers it up as it goes. So you just pull it behind once you till it up, and it plants rows of seeds. Um, before that, you're hand planting seeds for thousands and thousands of acres of land, which would take forever. So it's kind of surprising that it took as long as it did also with this, because it's mechanica mechanicized, mechanized, whew, mechanical and yeah, mechanized, is that uh, you have the ability to make that hole a little bit deeper, which is then going to protect it even further from like the weather and the conditions and the rodents and bugs that would eat the seeds. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to greatly improve uh, the efficiency of which you can plant then you have the mechanical reaper. 
Okay, and the Mechanical Reaper is actually also dates all the way back to the early 1700s. The very most basic uh, idea of a Mechanical Reaper to a guy named Jethro Tull. Yeah, like the band. Yeah. Um, kindred Spirits over here. Great band. Uh, Jethro Tull. Huh? Sure. And... Um, he does invent the basic idea of the Mechanical Reaper. You still had to push it, and it basically just had a spinning blade. It was kind of like a push lawnmower without an engine. You just kind of push it like the old school ones that you might have seen where you like push it back and forth real fast and you sharpen the blades, and it just kind of does that. That's the kind of idea, but for like grain. Um, it's not necessarily um, perfect, but ultimately about, I don't know, as time goes on, it's going to be greatly improved. And the person who really gets credit for the more modern, I guess, mechanical reaper is a guy named Cyrus McCormick, which also might be a name that stands out to you because, yeah, the spices, oatmeal. McCormick doesn't make oatmeal, does it? Uh, essentially, well, by the time this stuff is invented, there are no slaves, but, or you can just make your slaves more efficient. So you make more profit with the same amount of work. Correct, that those slaves can, yeah, so you make more money. So basically, Cyrus McCormick comes up with this, um, and so these two inventions, although they happen about 70 to 100 years apart, team up together and eventually make food production incredibly uh, efficient. Um, once they kind of get to the late 1800s, you get steam power, you get internal combustion engines. They're going to take these two machines and put engines on them, and you no longer have to pull them with horses. And it's also going to greatly improve, increase their size because you know, even if you have a team of horses, there's only so much that they can pull across a field. But once you put an engine on it, you're going to end up with these giant combines that can do, you know, 30, 40 rows at a time or whatever. Huge machines and tractors and all of that stuff. The next invention that really is an enormous uh, thing is the invention of steel. Uh, because of steel, you're going to have a much stronger material to build with. Uh, factories that are going to, and machines that are going to be, have a lot of stress on them. Before steel are being made out of iron. Iron is a far more brittle. It's softer metal that was not necessarily a good uh, material to, to build like boilers and steam engines out of. Uh, the early boilers and steam engines were made out of cast iron and like, like a cast iron pan. Um, and obviously a lot of pressure and a lot of uh, heat goes into that and they would quite often explode, <clears throat> like quite often. Yeah, and pressure, and you're basically you're pressurizing steam in a cast iron kind of mold. Uh, steel comes along and it's gonna greatly change uh, the safety of those things. But also, more, most importantly, um, the two things it's going to innovate the most is rail lines and how fast steel can be produced using the Bessemer process um, is going to be extremely beneficial in the production of rail lines because now steel can be made much faster and much cheaper. Uh, so you have some you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of miles of rail that are gonna be uh, laid out between 18, you know, 30, 1840 and 1900. Uh, and so, the steel production is going to greatly increase uh, rail production and, and also, you know, allow machines to work more, more efficiently without breaking as often. But the biggest impact of steel is going to be in buildings. Um, when you start building all these factories, the factories are typically located in urban areas. That means populations are going to have to move there to get the jobs. When they move there, they're going to have to live somewhere uh, close enough to the factory that they can get to work. Because remember, before cars, poor people don't have horses and carriages. They're having to work, and they're having to walk to work. So it has to, everybody has to live close to the factories. Well, uh, if you're building a, something with wood, you have a maximum of about three stories, probably. Two, three, four stories max, 
and that's the height you can get to. If you're using regular iron beams, maybe you can get to eight or nine stories before it gets too dangerous. Uh, wind and, and stuff like that is going to you know, bend that iron. It's going to flex. Once you get steel, though, you can go, uh, I believe the uh, tallest building today is like 180 stories. It's like, it's like 2,700 feet tall. That's half a mile tall. Okay. It would take Noah two minutes to run from, if, it, if the building fell down from the base to where the end fell down. Yeah. Yeah, it'd take him two minutes, and he's fast. And literally a half, a half mile tall is how tall this building is. It's crazy. That's all possible because of steel. Obviously, then you're going to end up with cars and wheels and all these other things made out of steel. Much stronger, uh, much more preferable to iron. Uh, and like I said, because of the Bessemer process, it's going to get significantly cheaper to make. Yeah. Yeah, or catch on fire. Wooden buildings, wooden buildings caught on fire and just would take up half of a city because everything's made out of wood. And then once they use iron, you can only build it so tall because the wind will blow and iron's not strong enough to not bend, right? Like you can go take an iron rod out there and put enough pressure on it and it's going to bend. Now you can make the bigger the rod, it's harder it is. But once you get it about 80 feet up in the air and the wind is blowing, you've got all this sway. Sometimes those buildings sway and... And with iron, it would sway and just not sway back. It would just, or, and then it would weaken and then fall over. So, yeah. So, um, like, was the steel making, so was the steel process, like, in the beginning before the Bessemer method, was that, like, still, like, more efficient than, say, like, like the, midi, like, the more ancient methods, like, whenever they built churches, like, that were, like, super big? Yeah, they didn't use steel. They used iron and wood. Oh, so the Bessemer process oh yeah, because the iron yeah. was steel at the same time? Huh? No, steel was being produced, but uh, to, take, to make one, you know, t let's say 10-foot beam of steel would take a day and a half. Once Bessemer figures out his process of blasting it in a blast furnace and blasting air into it to remove the impurities and get it hotter faster, once that process gets created, one beam could be created every 10 minutes. You get what I'm saying? So way more efficient, way faster, which then you get way cheaper because of that. And so steel had been around, uh, but it was not cost effective by any means to, to build with, and it wasn't even to that quality. It still was very difficult to remove all the impurities. So you might buy steel. You can get steel that is very brittle. If you don't get all the impurities out and you get bubbles and you get all this stuff, you can take, there's some steel, it'll bend. There's some of it that is so brittle that you could take it if it was a thin sheet and just smack it on and shatter it. Uh, so it made it consistent and it made it, you know, quality assurance became once the Bessemer process takes place, you know, every time I make a steel beam, that steel beam is the same as the old steel beam and they're all going to be to the same quality pretty much. Do they not have bricks? Like, like, bricks are you think they'd be making more stuff out of steel? I mean, they did, but still, like, you can't make a skyscraper out of bricks, bro. Go stack some Legos up. <laughs> Yeah, once you get 200 feet in the air, those Legos are coming down, bro. Didn't the Mesmer guy, did he, like, not, like, patent it? No, he did. He, he licensed it to everybody. He didn't actually use it himself. So uh, you have here, obviously, some problems. You can see some of these factories. This is actually, for some reason, is a negative of a picture. But these smokestacks, they're... A huge reliance on fossil fuels takes place during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we start burning coal and oils for fuel. This is going to greatly improve or greatly increase our air pollution. Cities become very smog-filled, dangerous places to live. Just, I mean, people living in cities, life expectancy of living in a city goes way down. Um, and that's kind of one of those, you know, bad parts of... Um, this industrial revolution because there's no you know OSHA there's no EPA there's no anybody that's regulating what you're putting out or where you're putting the waste from your factories or anything like that uh, so it's very not a good good situation in some ways but you know hey you, you get what you get this is Andrew Carnegie he is just one of the few guys that we're going to talk about um, he is a millionaire in the steel business uh, in fact he does that by putting everybody else out of business he creates one of the first what we call monopolies or trusts 
with what his company called U.S. Steel, which he sets up in Pittsburgh. Now, Carnegie uh, practices something called horizontal integration. And him along with Rockefeller, who also takes that and does vertical integration as well, but horizontal integration is the idea that uh, we are go I'm going to, if I make steel, what are all the components needed to make steel? Well, i got to have factories. So most steel people were like, well, I'm just going to be the factory owner, and then I'm going to buy the iron and the coal and all this stuff from other companies and have it shipped here. Well, Carnegie goes, well, that's a waste of money. How about this? I go buy the coal mine. I go buy the iron mine. I buy the railroad that transports it. I buy the factory. I buy the trucking company that's going to deliver the steel to somewhere. I buy the construction company that's going to use the steel to build stuff. And now every aspect of this steel from ground to skyscraper is just me paying myself through all these different companies. And because he can just pay himself, he can give himself great deals on prices, far more better prices than anybody else can get on their materials. So they go out of business. And when they go out of business, he takes this profit that he has, and he buys their factories and their companies. And then by the end of it, he owns everything. At one point, I believe that US Steel was producing 80 to 85% of all steel made in the world. In the world was coming out of the U.S. steel plants in the United States. Um, he owned, I want to say, like some crazy number, like 65% of all iron mines around the world, something crazy. Like, um, it was nuts. Uh, he got very, very rich by putting everybody else out of business and using those profits to then grow his business. Um, he sets up in Pittsburgh, uh, and which is why, like, they're the Pittsburgh Steelers, right? Because that's where they made steel. But um, he makes a lot of money. Now, if you account for inflation and you account for, uh, you, know, you know, his money at his point in time and uh, what that would equate to today, Andrew Carnegie would be about the fourth richest person that ever lived. Uh, his total net worth in today's money would have been about $310 billion. Yeah, Rockefeller was richer. Yeah, oil, yeah. You know, oil. And so, 310 billion. You kind of put that in perspective. You're like, oh, you know, Jeff Bezos, he's got like $100 billion. Elon Musk, 100 something, 100 something billion, you know. Oh, those guys are so rich. This dude was like three times richer than them. Crazy. Now, he got a bad rap, and by the end of his life, he really starts to try and um, change the per public perception of him, he donates probably $200 billion of that uh, to charity, philanthropy. Uh, he invests in the arts. He creates concert halls like Carnegie Hall uh, in New York. He, he does those in almost every city in the, in the country. He also invests heavily in education, and uh, he believes that a country that can't read can't be profitable or compete globally. Um, and so he builds schools, but mostly he builds libraries and fills them with books all over the country. I believe, I'm not sure if we have a, I think the closest Carnegie Library to us is maybe Baton Rouge or Shreveport, but almost every major city in the country ended up with Carnegie Libraries where he basically said, hey, here's a couple hundred or a couple million dollars, build a very beautiful building and uh, fill it with books that kids can read for free. And, um, and people can get educated with. So donated a ton of money, but that's because people thought he was a crook and he treated his workers terribly and he didn't pay them crap and he didn't offer them any insurance and he just, all that $310 billion he made by exploiting workers and children and women and uh, crushing people's American dreams by putting them out of business and people thought this dude's a bad guy. And so he was like, I'm not a bad guy. I'm going to do good things with my money. So he was trying to buy everyone's love. There's a Carnegie Library in Jennings. There you go. And so he was smart. And so uh, the next group, the next thing we're going to talk about is the electric light. As we know, Thomas, and Thomas Edison, quote, unquote, invented the electric light, but he didn't. Uh, that's uh, propaganda, fake news. Uh, Thomas Edison invented uh, yeah, a lot of things. He was a good inventor, but the electric light was not really one of them. Uh, you may have heard the quote before from Thomas Edison, I didn't find a thousand ways, 
I didn't fail at making the light a thousand times. I found a thousand ways not to do it. That's crap. Yeah, something like that, like that it didn't work. You know, like I succeeded in finding a lot of ways that it doesn't work. The idea is that like don't give up. You know, failure is not failure. It's success at finding a way not to do it. That's the idea. Except that that's bullcrap because Edison didn't even do that. He just read a bunch of stuff about how other people couldn't figure it out, and then he just did that. So it should be like I didn't fail a thousand times. Other people did, and I just took advantage of that. Um, because the first electric light was actually all the way back invented by a guy uh, named Humphrey Davy in 1806. Uh, Humphrey Davy went to a meeting of the Royal Society of London, which was basically like the 1806 version of Shark Tank. They would have these big giant meetings, and it was a bunch of rich people in London, and uh, inventors would come in, and that would be like their nice entertainment. So really, legitimately, just like Shark Tank. All these rich people would be dressed up to the tees, and they'd go to this house party, and poor inventors would come in and be like, look, I made a scrub daddy. Your spoons fit right in the mouth. And they were like, uh, get out of here. That's ridiculous. Nobody's going to buy a scrub daddy. Um, and then that dude would make million, hundreds of millions of dollars. But um, essentially, that's what he did. So Humphrey Davy goes in, and he's got this invention. And what he called it was an arc lamp. And what it was was two charcoal rods. Uh, and that he ran electricity to it, and when he would turn the electricity on, a active electrical spark, a bolt of lightning essentially, would go from one rod to the other, and then that would create light and shine brightly. Um, and this was not practical, though. This is an electric light, yes, but it is not a useful electric light, because if we had arc lamps in here, we would all cook to death. Because an arc lamp, uh, while you may not realize you know what it is, the that signals an arc lamp, an arc light. Uh, or the lights out outside of movie theaters and premieres and stuff that are like, shine the light like way up in the sky. You can literally see the beam because it's so bright and they get so hot. That's what he invents, not practical. So then you have a 70 year journey of lots of other inventors trying to figure out a way to turn that idea into an incandescent bulb that can be used in everyday life. And there are Dozens of inventors who kind of figure out each individual step along the way, but it is Thomas Edison and his uh, company that end up figuring out the perfect way to do all the other things that everybody failed to do and put them into a single package, and he gets credit for inventing the light bulb in 1879. Uh, good for him. But, um, you know, he was a uh, good inventor, but he had a lot of really smart guys working for him. Uh, he would hire guys like Nikola Tesla, and this is a funny picture because you have the cat, Nikola Tesla, he's fishing and putting his catch in a bucket, and then Thomas Edison comes and fishes out of his bucket, <laughs> which is kind of what Edison would do, which is not necessarily wrong when you get hired by a company to work for that company, and then you invent something using that company's materials and resources and investment, that company gets to own your invention. That's basically what's happening here. Uh, but he does invent some other very important things, lots of things, uh, like the phonograph, which, uh, and this is Edison here. Uh, you can't see him. Sorry. This is the ghost of Edison. Um, and so he was very cocky. Uh, good inventor, though. He has hundreds of patents. Uh, he was also very, uh, you know, invested in, like, direct current, which is stupid. He wanted to power the entire world with direct current, which is dumb. That's stupid you'd basically have to have an electric generator, like a substation every like mile. It would never work. It's so dumb. Huh? Oh. He did invent the phonograph though and stuff like this and he does change like so society and uh, social ways of doing things. Um, you know, oh, dang. And um, this is like to play music and he figures out how to, you know, put like on a wax tube. It's before like record players, but it's like a wax tube and you would slide it on here. It's got a needle and a speaker there. And as it goes over there, it would play the sound. So he does invent lots of important things. Um, and, you know, not to shake a stick at it, you know, but, you know, he had his problems and uh, he didn't invent the light bulb. Well, he kind of invented the light bulb. So, uh, next lecture, we're going to talk about all the different radically changing things. We're going to talk about 
Rockefeller and the oil, uh, you know, industry, and then some of the social problems that are going to come up because of the Industrial Revolution. The end. <laughs>